give you a, a brief overview of uh, the various electrical CPD courses that I'm running with uh, Engineers Ireland. Just a little bit of my own background to show you where I'm coming from, and sort of what uh, knowledge I bring with me from the industry. I started my career uh, 45 years ago as an apprentice electrician. And uh, when I completed my apprenticeship, I went on and studied, continued studying electrical engineering with DIT. And uh, I got into the consultancy business uh, with the Lap and Waller. And basically, that's where I spent most of my career working as a consulting engineer. I came over for a short while doing commissioning controls and HVAC controls and things like that. And went back to it, more or less spent the rest of my career in consultancy. So design specifications and all that type of stuff. Um, so that's where most of the knowledge I share in, in my training programs comes from my background in those areas. I started my own consultancy in 1999, Dervin Engineering Consultants, and I emerged with a UK firm, well, they're a global firm now, Condal, in 2016. And I retired in 2019 from my, my, my mainstream career, if you like. And I set up uh, Best Training, basically delivering courses through Engineers Ireland. And I've been doing that since for the last four years. And um, through COVID, it gave me an opportunity actually to develop other courses I wasn't planning to do. So we, we look at a few of those in, in a moment. So that's just a slide is just really summarizing what I, I, I mentioned earlier on. Uh, just down the bottom there, I've been a member of, uh, obviously a member of Engineers Ireland throughout my uh, entire career, but I've been uh, a member of the Electrical uh, Division uh, Committee for the last uh, four years, and I chaired the Electrical Division uh, last year, 2022 to 23. Um, one of my goals on it was to promote um, CPD, get 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 it out there to the, the public, what we actually do in the Electrical Division and all the various training courses that we can provide. Um, so that was supposed to happen within my tenure. So I've missed, just missed it by a month, let's say. So um, here we are today anyway. Um, I've also been uh, Engineers Ireland, the liaison for the NSEI uh, ETC Low Voltage Committee. So basically the Low Voltage Committee looks after the maintenance, upgrade, etc., of the, of the wiring rules for low voltage installations. So I've been he heavily involved in that uh, for the last few years. And I, I chaired a specific uh, working group on technical queries that come in when people look for an interpretation of the wiring rules because they can be a bit gray and a bit muddy in parts. So they look for, for guidance, clarification. And so I kind of chaired a little small working group on that for uh, the last few years. Right, so some of the courses I do, the very first course I started off doing was data centers. Throughout my career, I was uh, fairly heavily involved, particularly the last 10 years, I suppose, seven, well, seven or eight years, I was heavily involved in a uh, data center side of things and one of the problems we had was getting staff with relevant experience so if you're working on data centers from an electrical perspective you need a good knowledge of medium voltage and then critical power systems like generators and ups so i first developed the course on data centers and the main focus was on it the course called intro to m e services but it predominantly focuses on power and cooling systems so cooling is not necessarily um uh, electrical services but um, you've got to know how to power these cooling systems up and how they're all uh, work together so I cover both power and cooling on it a little bit on fire suppression um, and building management system very very small bit um, I realized then that people actually wanted more people were saying to me do, do you do have anything more on uh, medium voltage and low voltage etc so I developed a number of other specific modules I thought would be good for people that are, say, working in a low voltage background, say, on things like schools, offices, hotels, which are not overly complex from an electrical design point of view. Moving from those type of buildings into data centers is a big leap. So the three areas that people would be kind of lacking in the relevant skill set, I suppose, is, is on the medium voltage side, UPS and generator. So I developed separate one day modules for those. Um, so the medium voltage course, it's a basic one day course um, and it covers everything from, uh, you know, basic uh, standards that are out there connecting onto the grid at medium voltage, how it's done. It looks at different types of uh, switchgear systems, uh, withdrawable switchgear, fixed switchgear, um, air insulated, gas insulated, how the breaker actually works, uh, the battery alarm tripping unit and all that, how the whole switchgear assembly comes together. Then it goes on and looks at um, instrument transformers, CTs, VTs, 
metering and all of that and some uh, basic uh, protection uh, systems that we use at medium voltage. The vast majority of projects that most building service engineers are involved in is uh, circuit breakers feeding onto transformers or other sub switch gear systems. Basically, it's it's they're not overly complex the systems that they're designing. So that's what the course is focused on. So it's not suitable for someone that's working on, for example, uh, that's looking to work on offshore wind farms. Um, Podrick will be talking to you shortly, and he does a lot of other courses on medium voltage, which will explain that uh, would work very well with this uh, introductory course that I do there. So the next one I did then is UPS systems, uninterruptible power supply systems. So it's the first line of defense in, in a critical power system in a data center or a hospital or whatever. So this is the battery backup system. So they're designed, the UPS system is designed to provide short term energy storage to, to allow the generator to start up. So it fills in that gap when the mains fails while you're waiting for this big uh, diesel engine to crank up to get up to the speed and everything else, which can take, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. So the UPS provides um, backup power during that duration, but it also has other functions like providing clean, um, noise-free power to the critical load throughout uh, normal operation as well. So it does lots of other things. So that's, um, I do a full one-day course on that, and then I do a full one-day course on diesel generators. So diesel generators is obviously providing your long-term power backup. So typically in a data center, that could be anything from um, 24 hour backup all the way up to say 96 hour, four days uh, backup in a, a tier four type data center. So um, so generators covers everything from the basic starts off at the basics, the engine, the alternator, controlling things like the speed, uh, the load transfer system, synchronizing with the mains. And then it covers all the kind of non-electrical stuff. So when I covered generators, for example, in college, all I, all I knew about generators was uh, formulas for calculating uh, the generation of the EMF within the alternator. I knew nothing else about the engine, the cooling system, uh, the exhaust system, fuel storage, pumping fuel around the side. So all these other topics, I deal with them again at a very basic level. It's a one day course, but it gives you a, a good insight on what you need to know to spec up a complete uh, uh, generator installation. Um, so I do those as separate one-day courses, and I've recently, in the last year, I think, with engineers on, we've amalgamated the two courses now, and we call it critical power for people that maybe don't want as an in-depth uh, level of training and that. They just want a kind of a higher level overview of critical systems. So I cover both topics in a one-day course as well, and that has become very popular. In fact, it's become more popular than the two separate one-day courses. So then um, I also have a range of courses on specifically on low voltage distribution. So um, I've won the original course I did was on, on low voltage switchgear. And the main focus of that course is on switchgear. So that course covers switchgear assemblies and then protective devices. So probably about eight modules in the course looks at the switchgear standards, the different types of um, assemblies, the forms of separation between protective devices, bus bars and terminals, etc. how that's all achieved. Uh, and it looks from the most basic boards, like, uh, you know, a consumer unit that you might have in your house, that type of simple assembly, all the way up to a very, very complex LV switchgear assemblies like this, uh, this image here, which is a unit uh, substation, double ended unit substation fed by medium voltage at both ends. Um, so it covers everything, uh, all types of uh, circuit breakers, air circuit breakers, molded case, uh, miniature circuit breakers, residual the current devices, all the various types of protective devices, include arc fault detection device, all these new devices that are coming on the market. So that's what that course does. In While we were delivering that course, people were saying, oh, do you do anything on cable size and cable management systems? And it realized that, you know, there was no point in trying to compress that course to finish the other things in. So we made a separate one-day course, which has been running for the last... 12 months, I think, um, it's called LV Power Wiring Systems, um, and in the full name is Wiring Systems and Installation Practices. So it covers everything from cables, cable management systems, a uh, basic overview of sizing cables, uh, voltage drop calculations, current current capacity calculations, uh, fault level analysis, uh, and all that type of thing. So it's a fairly comprehensive course, and it's very, very popular. 
Um, I mentioned earlier on that I was the liaison for uh, Engineers Ireland for the NSEI TC2 committee, which specifically looks after the wiring rules. So that's the book on the left there. And it's the wiring rules. The standard is IS 10101. It was published in 2020. And it's the fifth edition of the wiring rules in Ireland. The previous editions were published by ETCI, who uh, no longer exist. So all, all their good work they did over the years has now been taken on board by NSEI. So it was published in 2020, and uh, it's very, very different uh, to previous versions. It's um, somewhere in the order of 750 pages in it now. So there's a lot of new material in it that never appeared in any of the previous standards. Um, so anyway, I, I do, it's probably the most, after data centers, that's the most popular course I deliver. But it's obviously starting to wind down now because people are familiar with it and um, it's been out there for three years. I also published a book on it, The Wiring Rules in Ireland, an illustrated guide to IS10101, which is still very popular. Um, first thing I did this morning, down to it still sells every, 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 there's hardly a week goes by, I don't sell two or three copies of it. So um, yeah, that's just kind of a, a, a good guide to help you interpret the, the wiring rules because some parts of it are quite difficult to uh, interpret. So other courses then, and um, this top course is actually my favorite course to do because it's fundamentals of m and &E consultancy. When I started m and &E consultancy, I had just completed an apprenticeship and maybe two or three years experience under my belt. And I actually thought I knew everything. There's nothing anybody could tell me about electricity. And then I went in uh, and worked for the lap water. And the first thing I was working on was drawing a cross section through a lift shaft. And to be honest with you, I hadn't a clue what I was doing. Um, and then when I started later on in my career, I was responsible for putting specifications together. I understood nothing about contractual terms and, and all this stuff that you need to know. Um, and so I, I, I was very much in the dark about a lot of it. And of course, I learned it like everyone as, as I went along. I then learned a lot more about uh, specifying equipment and designing and all of that. Um, so this course is actually aimed at people coming into the consultancy business, maybe from a different back, background. For example, it's quite common for electricians now uh, to become consulting engineers to do a career change at the end of their, you know, a few years after they complete their apprenticeship. Um, so that's what that course is aimed at. Are people coming straight out of college to have all the theory and this just gives them some practical guidance what a consultant does and contractual terms, uh, the various services that an electrical consultant will be involved in. So it goes through everything, power, um, you know, medium voltage, low voltage power, small power distribution, lighting, fire safety services, all that type of stuff. It explains it very briefly. Um, and again, on the right end, another course that we've de I've developed recently is Fundamentals of Electrical Services. A big call for this that people just want the basics of what an electrical, what are the services in electrical consultant designs? And it just gives you know, a few slides on each of those topics that I've just mentioned there. Uh, power, small power, lighting, emergency light and fire alarm, maybe five or six slides in each one, just gives you a flavor. And then people can look at nearly everything that's covered in fundamentals. Most of the topics are covered in more detail in the other courses that I do. And then finally, the last two courses I have, they're not running yet for the simple reason uh, there's a delay in publishing the new standards. So both lighting, sorry, emergency lighting uh, standard is IS3217 in Ireland. Uh, that standard is being updated at present. So it was due to be published at the end of last year. Um, and there's a, a, a slight delay in it. So I think it'll be later this year when it's published. So I have a course developed, which I could run now, but I, I, we're, we're waiting till the new standard comes out. So that, that would be a, a greater interest in the people who want to, you know, find out what happened, what's new in the new standard. So that's the main objective of that course. And then fire alarm and fire suppression system. So again, this is a course on fire alarms. Main focus is on the, the new Irish standard, IS3217, 3218. But I also cover a little bit on fire suppression systems on it, the different types of gaseous fire suppression systems um, and, and a little bit on sprinkler, et cetera, and the interface with the fire alarm system. So again, fairly comprehensive course, great one. Um, as I say to nearly everybody when I start this, I wish these courses were around when I started in uh, consultancy. Um, they, they weren't around. You could pick them up in dribs and drabs here and there and determine ter lunch and learn sessions and that type of thing. But um, I, I wish they were around, whatever, 30 years ago when I, when I needed them. 
Okay, it's just very brief the way the courses work. There, I use PowerPoint. Uh, I do a mixture of online and face-to-face -face training, sometimes hybrid training. Uh, typical course takes eight hours. They're usually a full day course I do. Um, there's no assessment involved. As uh, some people ask for uh, multiple choice assessment at the end, but generally I don't, I don't do that unless I specifically ask for it. So normally nine to five and approximately 150 slides I cover per presentation. Um, and that, uh, that's full on getting through all of that. Um, usually recommend about 15 candidates, but we can do larger groups if you want. But 15 candidates, I think, is, is, is good size group to work at. Um, I also publish handouts of all the courses I do. If people want them, I can go off and get them uh, printed. They can make those nice little booklets. Um, and basically, that's it. That's the format of the, of the courses. Um, most of what I do is delivered through Engineers Ireland. Um, so I do them as online classroom courses or in company training for larger groups. In fact, I think we have an in company training in the morning um, on medium voltage, for example, and that's in Cloud Road. So my first time back in Cloud Road in a few years. Um, some people then have spe very specific requirements and they want a bespoke course developed and they want training material printed. Uh, they want a booklet printed. Uh, Done for the course. So I do that as well for some larger organizations, ask for that, some very, very specific. They usually come and they want bits and different parts of the different courses, and it's very, very specific. So I also do that as well. But all of the courses run through Engineers Ireland. That's the most common uh, platform. And that's just a sample of some different types of images. I won't go through them, but uh, most of the images I use, they're self-generated. I don't use, in general, other people's images. I draw them from scratch to explain different concepts. And I try to boil things down to the, the very basics and then build it up bit by bit. That's typical uh, little diagrams that I, I produce. So I won't go through all this slide. It's, it's actually just summarizing what I've just spoken about there. So you'll have access to this later on. It goes through all the various courses there, course title, um, and over here, the course aims. Most of the courses that I do are aimed at um, electrical engineers, data centers, very popular. We've got architects, quantity surveyors, mechanical, electrical, civil, structural. It's really, really popular. Other than that, most of the courses are uh, almost all focused at uh, electrical engineers or people with an electrical background. Um, but occasionally I do get people saying, look, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm now supervising electrical people. And they come on and they want to do some of the courses. That's common enough as well. Right, um, so I won't go through them all, as I say, because we kind of just talk, talked about them very briefly. And uh, just to say there, this one, the critical power, is a one-day version of the two uh, one-day courses on generators and UPS systems. Okay, now, and the reason I won't go through it, because all of this is available. If you're interested in reading more, all of the courses I spoke about there, I have a CPD catalog, which you can uh, download. Uh, from at my website there and explains all the courses aims objectives uh, and everything it breaks down and gives you a breakdown of the modules and everything that you uh, cover on each course so it's 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 a fairly comprehensive uh, catalog if you want to do it. that's the email uh, website address there besttraining.ie right so that's uh, it, it from me i'm gonna hand you over to podrick there my email address is there cpd training engineers are and etc and www.besttraining.ie for further details so i'm gonna pass you over without further ado over to uh, podrick and we'll take questions and answers at the end then thanks brendan um that was great uh good afternoon everybody let me just get this shared So hopefully that's working for everybody there. Um, yeah, thank you, Brendan. And uh, thank you, Elva and Engineers Ireland for uh, arranging this webinar. And thanks everybody for, for attending. It's great to, that we have such a big attendance. Um, contact details there. Again, as Brendan said, um, I have uh, information on the website on, on my courses. Um, so I'll run through this fairly, fairly quickly. Um, a few words about myself. Um, I'm sort of uh, of a similar vintage to uh, Brendan. I've been, well, a bit more than 35 years. I've capped it at that. Um, roughly, I was uh, 10 years with um, uh, PALS Transformers and Distribution and Power Transformer, uh, both here in Ireland and 
in Belgium and in Indonesia. Um, I was about 10 years as an owner's engineer role in an owner's engineer role with Mott McDonald and about 12, 15 years in HV contracting, 10 of them with, with uh, Kirby Group, uh, managed their T&D division, then with Office Power Systems. Um, I'm on the various um, technical committees. Um, I was part of the um, original ETCI uh, committee, which became um, NSAI TC3, uh, which was primarily dealing with uh, 61936, but is now also dealing with 5110. And in the last couple of years, I've, I've joined the IEC committee on 61936 and the Senelec committee on, on 5110, and recently a PC project committee 128, which is a new committee dealing with safe management operation of electrical installations, but I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, very briefly, about the four courses that, that I have on offer. Um, and those courses actually, Complement Brendan's courses. I actually got into training about three years ago as well. And uh, one of the first things I did was take Brendan's data center and MV course um, just to see what it was all about. And there were excellent courses. So I've designed my courses around that and they, they take a different perspective. And so they complement each other. So we're not, we're not sort of doubling up and reinventing the wheel. I'm also going to say, have a couple of slides on the Engineers Ireland um, practice note which came out uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and th th that note actually um, feeds into course three and four. These courses are designed to inform people how to um, work with the advice given in that note which is a follow-on from a, a, an issues paper which came out uh, which was published this time last year. Um, so the first course is an introduction and it's um, it's aimed at um, it's aimed at entry level people into the electrical um, industry. It could be graduates, uh, also let's say mechanical engineers, civil engineers, health and safety professionals, asset owners, asset managers, anybody who wants a basic understanding of HV installations, the dangers, you know, the main components, terminology, uh, and we go into single line diagrams and then operation and maintenance. Um, and again, it's a one day course as Brendan's are um, with uh, about 10 modules. Uh, we go into the fundamentals, um, layouts and boundaries between different installations, uh, parts of, this, of the installation and, and main pieces of equipment. Uh, one module on the grid transformer or power transformer, which is a, a, key, a key element. Um, and then we have uh, a module on single line diagrams and what's you know, their importance and the information contained in them. And then another module on how to work on the installation using the single line diagram. A um, little bit on maintenance um, and a module on, it's a, it's a legal module basically on, on technical due diligence required to actually take over an asset or buy an asset, uh, which we find um, asset owners and managers uh, are particularly interested in. And, um, then finally, two modules uh, introducing the applicable standards for design and construction and for operation and management. Um, the second course is a power transformer course, and that's um, it's delivered uh, with um, experts from Gantz Power Transformers. Um, it's intended to, again, provide an understanding of specification, testing, uh, installation commissioning, maintenance uh, of power an operation of power transformers it's um it's quite uh, it's quite involved it's um it's there's a lot in it and we might actually split it into two courses it's scheduled for october um the previous introduction is is scheduled for 8th of 8th of uh, september the links are here you'll find them on your course notes when you when you get them um so as an overview um we go into the legal requirements and standards and with particular reference to um, suppliers, manufacturers, designers of, of articles, which was which is dealt with in section 16 of the of the Shaw Act. Um, then an overview of the different types of tests on transformers, um, and then some a module on design and how 
specification, how to specify a power transformer. Uh, then it goes into the tests themselves, the ra ratio vector group and resistance test, noise level and losses, temperature rise and hotspot, uh, the insulation tests, you know, including the uh, separate source withstand and uh, impulse tests. Um, then mechanical tests, deflection tests, leak tests, etc. cetera. Um, then a, a module on transport assembly and site acceptance testing of a transformer and how that would compare with factory acceptance testing. Um, a module on maintenance and operation and a final module on monitoring, um, monitoring a transformer during service. So there's a lot in there, probably too much. Um, the feedback we're getting is that it's really good, but it's probably an information overload in one day. So it probably makes sense to, um, to split it over two days and maybe and and maybe put some extra information in there. So that's that's uh, scheduled for October as one or two courses, and uh, we have to see where we're, where we're going with that. Um, so before I go into the uh, the, the the course three and four, uh, just talk about this um, Engineers Ireland practice note, which was issued there a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, there's a link there that people can use when the, when you get your notes. Um, or you can get it on the engineers website there at, um, I, I, I can't say exactly where, but you can follow the link. Um, but it's based, or it's very much associated with um, the current HSA guidance, um, which um, was a result of the issues paper that uh, Engineers Ireland Electrical Division issued this time last year in May 22. And uh, so the current HSA advice uh, refers to ISEN 61936-1 and ISEN 5110-1 um, as standards which could be used as an argument to demonstrate compliance with the relevant parts of Part 3 of the uh, 2007 Act, uh, Act and General Applications Regulations and other relevant le legislation. And, and one one... A particular reg regulation there is Regulation 76 in Part 3 of the General Apps uh, Regulations, which it, which states that a uh, an installation uh, should be designed, constructed, installed, maintained, protected, and used so as to prevent danger. And uh, basically, if you take 61936-1, uh, that will help demonstrate compliance with design, constructed, installed, and protected. Um, and 5110 can be used to demonstrate that the installation is used to prevent danger. There is no standard covering uh, maintenance, but I but I deal with that in the course. So uh, just have a quick look at the standards. Uh, 61936 um, was reissued uh, or was revised in 2021. And just looking at the history, um, people may be aware of ET103. 2015 was which was intended to be the high voltage wiring rules to complement the ET 101 which was which were the low voltage wiring rules at the time but as Brendan referred to earlier um ETCI became subsumed by uh, NSAI and that document then became SR61936 um and it was based on the uh, EN 61936-1-2010, as it, as it was at the time, uh, plus the grid code requirements, distribution code requirements, and other, and other local requirements, which were um, included in the document in, in grey boxes. But um, as 61936 was being revised, um, we got all of that stuff transferred across into Annex G, of 61936-1-2021 uh, and Annex G is the Annex for National Requirements. So thankfully now we have all of this information in the current version of 61936 and that standard is generally accepted uh, internationally uh, as the minimum requirement to demonstrate that an electrical insul installation has been installed properly, is fit for purpose and so is, is safe, safe to operate. Um, on the operation side, uh, we've got one standard, which is available. This is the only standard 
uh, internationally at the moment that that's available. Uh, there are standards in the US which deal with the US situation, but this is the only international standard and certainly the only one in the in the in the EU and Sinaitic region. It was first uh, issued in in ninety six. Current issue is twenty thirteen, but the new uh, revision uh, is now out is now being voted on and. Uh, the text is approved. Um, that Senate committee I mentioned earlier, that's what we've been doing for the past number of years. So that should be published in quarter four of this year. And in short, that um, standard uh, deals with the operation of and work activity on with or near electrical installations from low voltage to high voltage. So it's not just the high voltage standard. So everything from extra low voltage, which are, which are 50 volts, all the way up to, you know, in this country, 400 kV is covered by the principles in this standard. Uh, what we do have, oh, sorry. And again, that is generally accepted um, in Senelec, in Senelec countries as a minimum requirement to demonstrate that an electrical installation has been managed and operated safely. Um, and that then led into the, to the current HSA advice. Uh, what we also have is at IEC level, we have PC Project Committee 128, which was formed in 2021, uh, on the subject of the safe management and operation of electrical installations. And the idea or the, the objective there is to uh, publish a technical specification in 2025. Um, and that technical specification, you know, there's a first draft at the moment, it's it's based on 5110, but it has more information in it and it has more guidance and it has a slightly broader, a broader um not scope but 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 content. So based that leads on then to the actual advice uh, that Engineers Ireland give in the practice note. And what, what Engineers Ireland is saying is that in order that owners of and persons working on or near high voltage installations uh, can carry out their duties described in the, the Shaw Act and, and regulations in regard to prevention of danger from electricity. Um, Engineers Ireland members are, are advised to ensure insofar as is reasonably practical and within their control, those five things. One, that, that um, installation owners and operators only energize HV installations which have been confirmed um, by suitably competent person as being compliant with ISEN 61936-1. And that contractors um, delivering HV works have a nominated person employed or engaged as a consultant who has the competence to confirm that compliance. So they 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 will go together. And then on the on the operation side that installation owners comply with uh, 5110-1 including the appointment of an installation manager and provision of electrical safety rules and organization as required in those clauses of the standard and an installation manager the installation manager term is the term used in the new version of the standard and um, in the old version it was the person responsible for the electrical installation and people um, in this country or in the uk might be familiar with the term hv system manager or electrical system manager it's the same role um, a fourth piece of advice is that operations and work um, on or near the installation are carried out in accordance with 5110-1 and only on installations which are managed. So in other words, if you're a contractor carrying out work on an installation, that you should only do that if that installation is managed by an installation manager and there is a, a set of electrical safety rules in place already which you can work with. And the fifth piece of advice then is not really in relation to standards, but is that people or that, that uh, contractors and uh, installation owners have clear processes in place uh, for the assessment of competence and authorization of persons, you know, managed by a nominated competent person. And that then feeds feeds back into the, the, the first four pieces of advice. In other words, that, that um, you, you uh, comply with standards, but then your people are also suitably competent. So that's the basis for the, the last two courses. Um, this is a new course, actually. Um, it's It's been run on the 6th of July. I'm, uh, I'm still working on the slides and the content. So um, 
hopefully hopefully it's all done by then um there's a link there to for booking um basically that course is to clarify uh, the legal duties applicable standards and best practice advice now it's not a course on how to carry out a fall study or how to uh, select switch gear or and so on that's stuff that brendan does in his courses and there are other courses um available but it's basically to to put a framework on the overall uh, design and construction process so as an overview it goes into the the fundamentals and dangers of high voltage then into the legal requirements and that goes uh, in specifically into the sections of the shaw act uh, construction regulations and general applications regulations part three electricity which uh, deal with design and construction of uh, of hv installations and the manufacture and supply of of equipment um there's a module on the comp competence requirements for design construction and commissioning and then we get into the standard um general requirements which are um a reflection of the content in clauses four and five of the standard um equipment and installations is the next um module um based on clauses six and seven protection against hazards based on clauses eight nine and ten design risk assessment um it's a separate module on that advice guidance and uh, not related to that st the standard which doesn't um which doesn't deal with it um Construction quality again, uh, some some advice and um, and general and general guidance, and then we get back into the standard clause eleven testing and the confirmation of compliance and how that process might work. Um, it's not just a matter of electrical testing. You, the the, the standard deals with uh, you know structural elements, mechanical elements, uh, access, egress. Um, design for safe maintenance and operation and so on and how all of that would feed then into a confirmation that the installation has complied with the standard and is so and so is safe to operate um, and the final module then is on handover training o m manual what's there are some new requirements in clause 12 of the standard in relation to o m manual and documentation and training and handover and how that feeds into the overall um, compliance with the uh, Shaw Act and regulations. A similar course then on operation and management, uh, which is next scheduled 22nd of September. We ran it in April. It's been on the go a couple of years now. Uh, it has a similar focus, uh, which again clarifies the legal duties, applicable standards and best practice advice. Uh, and as an overview, we go into fundamentals and dangers, the legal requirements, focusing on um, people who own assets, who operate assets, who manage assets, um, um, which is a different focus to the design and construction. But we have, we have um, one module there just briefly covering the um, 61936 standard. Now that might, that might, I might reduce some of that. Um, as the other course is now up and running um, and put extra content in other places but we'll see some guidance on maintenance as i said that's not maintenance to prevent danger is what's required under the uh, act and regulations but there's no standard covering that so what we have is various guidance documents available from let's say the hse in the uk uh, segre other organizations and we've put a module together uh, on that advice for for people um then we get into the standard itself management and operation roles organization rules planning how to do all of that and what the role to explain the roles explain the organization specified in the standard and how to then uh, explain what should be covered by rules and how the plan works in accordance with with uh, with best practice and the standard uh working procedures and operational procedures uh we have a module on safety documents on competence and training and finally on safe systems of work and uh, that really pulls everything together in terms of, of using your standards your rules uh, your competence your authorizations safety documents and how that should be uh, sort of applied 
uh, to a particular job or installation as a as a safe system of work. So that's that's me. That's a few bullet points on what um, Power Kilbride Power do as management consultants. You'll find that in your um, in your notes. Uh, some contact details. Um, I went through that quite quickly, so I'm quite happy to uh, take emails or phone calls from anybody if they if they need to to uh, find out more. Uh, the training courses are on the website, and uh, you'll find them on the CPD calendar or as, as Brendan does. Um, I can I can do specific courses for for specific needs as required. Okay, I've taken up enough of your time. Thanks very much, everybody, and I'll uh, stop sharing and pass over. To, uh, to to Neil, I think is next. Uh, thank you very much, Padraig. Give me one second here. Uh, can everybody see uh, my screen? Yes, thanks, Neil. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Neil O'Sullivan, and uh, the course that uh, I present is called Fundamentals of Data Center Server Rack Power Design. And uh, again, uh, you can, my email is there at the bottom of the screen uh, if you want to get in touch about any uh, questions on it at nilotechconsulting at gmail.com. Um, this is my bio. Don't want to spend an hour of time on it. Uh, I'll just summarize to say that, you know, I've uh, spent pro the last 25 years or so working with uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley, California, uh, worked for Sun Microsystems, now Oracle, of course, also Cisco Systems, and uh, most recently Google, where I led up the data center power team. Um, so uh, my background is education, a bachelor's and a PhD from the University of Limerick. And if you wanna dive a little bit or look into it a little bit more, you can uh, look at my LinkedIn, or I think this is also on uh, the Engineers Ireland uh, website. So uh, back to the title of the course, Fundamentals of Data Center, Server Rack Power Design. I thought we'd start with a fundamental question just to help explain what the course is about. And that is, you know, why do we have data centers? Why do we build data centers? And uh, the fundamental reason for building data centers, of course, is to house large scale compute and storage technology. And the core elements of compute, and compute technology uh, are CPUs, GPUs and TPUs often um, delivered or packaged in servers or accelerators and then inside racks and so on. There are, of course, uh, important uh, auxiliary elements as well, like uh, storage, uh, networking, power and cooling. But um, I think you'd sometimes uh, you, you'd be forgiven for thinking data centers are about the, you know, the huge building, the site, all that infrastructure. In fact, you know, I was at uh, a number of data center conferences in the past 12 months. And when you walk into those huge exhibit halls and you see security fencing, diesel generators, cable ducting, cloud apps and all this stuff. I mean, they're all important, but um, it, it's not why we build data centers. Again, as I say here, the, the reason data centers are built are to house large scale compute and storage technology. And the reason that's important is that, and the point I'm trying to make uh, with that is that if you build a building and then trying to squeeze in as much IT as possible, uh, it's a little bit like putting the cart before the horse in that it can be difficult to optimize and, and, and difficult to do the right trade-offs. But if you um, understand uh, the core IT needs and understand what these core computing, compute building blocks need to work properly or work optimally up front, um, then I think you'll be much more successful in understanding how they should be best deployed and powered at scale. And that will enable you to optimize performance, you know, make the right cost trade-offs, ensure you get the best efficiency, availability, uh, uh, or resilience, it's sometimes called resilience, uh, serviceability, and scalability as well. And uh, in this course, uh, we look at the fundamentals of how these core elements are powered, how, uh, uh, how servers and racks are powered, how different power methodologies have evolved over time, and the pluses and minus, uh, minuses of the different ones. And of course, we also examine trade-offs and real-world examples. And I think that's that's important because there's a lot of challenges 
when it comes to, uh, you know, because of the cost involved, especially, uh, there's a lot of challenges in, in optimizing uh, data centers. And there's also, I think, a lot of new challenges emerging. And uh, just to look at some of the new challenges, if you look at the newspapers over the last number of months, what I have here is just three articles from the Sunday Business Post from February, March, and April last, and all three talking about data centers. The first one is on the very top there, you know, data center building spend soars as investors pile in. Already in Ireland, uh, we've, you know, data centers have been in the news for the, the amount, the sheer amount of them that we have. I think there's about 70 data centers in Ireland, eight under construction and probably another 30 in planning, but th there's still a drive in Ireland and across the world to build more. I'll look a little bit more about why that is in a moment. The second headline is data centers have enough on-site power to meet energy needs of the entire country. And of course, this is a follow-on from that whole discussion there was some months back about data centers in Ireland consuming so much power, would there be enough power left for the rest of us, ordinary consumers? And in Ireland, data centers consume about 15 to 20% of the total generated power. And in fact, that's estimated to grow to about 30% of total generated power by 2030. And 30%, that's quite a lot when you compare it with the EU average, which is about 3%. But uh, power, is important and um, in the news, of course, because of the increasing energy cost, everybody is mindful and particularly data center owners are mindful of efficiency and the operational expense, the day-to-day -day operational expense of, of running a data center. Um, and also power is in the news from the renewable sustainable aspect. So in this course, we do uh, dive into quite a bit the efficiency and the cost and the trade-off between those things when it comes to the servers, the IT, and, and, and the power associated with all of those and how it's delivered. The last uh, bullet there is, or the last headline rather, is, you know, Irish data center giants will have to publish energy performance details under new EU law. And this is uh, really relating to the CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, a new requirement that has already been passed by the EU Parliament in 2022. Uh, the requirements will be phased into law from 2024. And basically it's facilitating this transition to a sustainable economy, uh, limiting global warming per the Paris Agreement and uh, trying to hit climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, the difference with this particular uh, directive is that it does uh, call for mandatory uh, reporting and, and third party auditing of uh, energy utilization and performance. And, it, and, and unlike the, head, the headline here would, would make you think it only applies to the giants or the hyperscalers, but actually uh, from my reading of the standards, it applies to everybody that, that has an IT load of 50 kilowatts or so or above, above 50 kilowatts. So it will cover you know, small data centers, mid-size and those large hyperscalers. And some of the new standards, I mean, I think a lot of people working in data centers would be familiar with PUE, a power usage efficiency. Um, and there's also something called WUE, water usage efficiency. But this, uh, this standard brings in new requirements for IT energy efficiency, for IT equipment utilization, energy reuse factor, and so on. There's many of them. And uh, there are standards like ISO 30134. Uh, and we discussed that and reviewed those in this course as well. Um, and as I said, it will apply to uh, existing data centers, and also any new new builds. But I want to skip back up to, uh, to number one there for a minute. And, and again, just touch on uh, this data center building spend, which is soaring and others more is and just being built uh, going forward and, and why this is. And of course, what's driving it is uh, the AI revolutions and data centers are at the forefront of artificial intelligence. And if you look there, at the left-hand side of the slide, you can see how uh, data, how machine learning model sizes have grown significantly. This is really since 2012. And you have, uh, you know, models like the, the DALI-2, which was uh, basically, it basically generates images and art from uh, descriptions in natural language, languages. Uh, Imogen is a, uh, 
image diffusion model, uh, text to image diffusion model, and OpenAI uh, GPT-3 is um, it's an autoregressive language model. And then you have at the very pinnacle of this, uh, and this again, this data is from maybe six to six or eight months ago, uh, a 1.6 trillion parameter model from Google Brain on, on languages. And, and, and they keep growing, these models keep growing in size. And more parameters mean you need the hardware, you need additional hardware to uh, be able to facilitate these models. And um, NVIDIA, of course, are one of the major uh, big players in developing uh, GPUs, which is the particular hardware technology used for uh, calculating and running the iterations of these models. And NVIDIA just recently hit I uh, just recently became a trillion dollar company uh, based on the success in demand for these GPUs. But these GPUs and configuring them in a matrix to accommodate these huge models is becoming, uh, is presenting lots of hardware challenges um, in, in, in the data center space because, you know, close integration is required in order to achieve minimum latency. And this is driving for higher efficiency and greater cooling and performance as well. And uh, the, the, uh, the NVIDIA GPUs like the H100, I mean, a single uh, GPU ASIC like, like the H100 can consume over 800 watts. And you're talking, you know, maybe hundreds or a thousand of these to create a particular, um, a particular uh, matrix for uh, um, a, a, a particular model. The, the picture here on the right-hand side shows a Google, a Google Cloud TPU pod. You know, it's four racks and uh, you can see everything is kind of connected together between those four racks. These four racks, I estimate, are about 120 kilowatts. And this is to run, I don't know which particular model they're running on this, but you know, I, I, I'm sure it's not the 1.6 uh, trillion parameter model. But you can see how the, there's a necessity to keep these racks integrated closely. And so this is what the point I mean by, you know, it's important to make, to understand what the core IT components need so that the deployment can be uh, done successfully to optimize its performance for the application in question. And so there, there are lots of new challenges, as I say, but there's also, uh, existing challenges with uh, with new data center builds and understanding the fundamentals is key to being successful in solving those challenges. And I think uh, probably one of the people that, that puts it best is uh, Gordon Moore. Uh, I'm sure most people have heard of, of Gordon Moore. He invented Moore's Law. He was the uh, CEO of, a uh, founding CEO of Intel. And he said that the technology at the leading edge changes so rapidly that you have to keep current after you get out of school. You know, a, a really strong nod to continuing professional development, which is what these courses that we're talking about here today are all about. So he went on to say that uh, I probably, that I think probably the most important thing is having good fundamentals. And so by having those good fundamentals, you can build a strong foundation and tackle those new challenges. So th this particular course, again, that uh, that I teach the fundamentals of data center server rack power design, we do get into the fundamentals of, of rack power and, and so on. And as I said already, we look at emerging regulations, we look at key power metrics, and it's more than just watts, of course. Uh, we look at uh, uh, data center IT racks from basic architecture to how it has evolved over the past number of years. We look at the architecture of, again, from a power perspective of servers, storage, and networking and AI technologies, and also 12 volts versus 48 volt systems. Uh, we look at the servicing and telemetry aspect, and then analyzing trade-offs. There are a lot of uh, real world practical examples uh, that I go through in this course, just to show how you can cost and compare uh, different trade-offs. And of course, uh, future technology considerations in terms of AIs, GPUs, TPUs, and so on. It's, as I said, it's a one day course, runs from nine to five. There's a break for lunch, of course, uh, but we, we do cover very practical, I think, aspects in the course, a lot of real world examples. And uh, I think it's pretty interesting and useful. This predict this next iteration of the course, which uh, I think is advertised in the um, 
18 years Ireland calendar. It'll be the third time teaching it. And each time I've taught it, I've, I've updated it to include um, the latest uh, information and uh, technology. Because as Gordon Moore said, you know, it's moving so fast, it's actually, it's pretty hard to keep up with it sometimes. We, we try to keep this, this course updated regularly so that it is uh, relevant and covering the latest topics. So, uh, I'll leave it there for the moment. If you have additional questions, we'll be able to answer them in the Q&A at the end. But uh, right now, I'll hand over to Guy Harding. Hi, everyone. It's not actually Guy. It's myself. It's oh, no, Anthony. Anthony. Just switch my microphone on. Thank you. It's OK. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen OK, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, basically, uh, a few years ago, the ILP, which is the Institution of Light and Professionals based in the UK, um, we started to partner with Engineers Ireland to deliver a certain bits of training. And this came off the back of um, devolution in the, the way that the, the lighting assets in, in Ireland were maintained. Um, it used to be an electricity company that looked after everything, and this was devolved to the local authorities. And as such, there became this, there was a huge need for understanding and the management of, of highway lighting and public ground lighting. Um, the institution had been around for, for a good while. We've been around nearly 100 years and doing exactly that. And we started off in as a, as a highway um, lighting institution only. Um, and now we're a bit more devolved. Um, but basically, um, what we've done is we've taken um, training courses that have been developed in the UK, uh, adapted them to make sure they fit within the Irish standards and everything else. And then um, in 2001, we delivered some online training courses um, within over COVID. Prior to that, we have also done some face-to-face -face courses for Engineers Island. So it's a real partnership between two institutions that don't really um, don't step on each other's toes. I think it's a nice way of putting it. Um, we don't have too many uh, any too many clashes, and it's worked really well for both. That, as far as I'm concerned, um, the one one benefit we do have is all our courses are delivered by practitioners so um, everyone does all of our training we're all um, apart from guy who is employed by the ilp we all have day jobs um, and we deliver training on specific items um, this does allow us to be quite flexible and as an institution we can deliver training on anything to do with for me exterior light um, that seems to be pretty much where we sit so say so i'm, a, I'm a, a past president i was a media past until last until about three weeks ago and I'm also a director at St. Design Services. So um, my background is exactly this. It's highway lighting and, and decorative lighting and architectural lighting. And also a guy who's on the call, um, he's technical services manager at the ILP. Um, the two main courses we currently have, um, oh, sorry, the, 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 the course that we aim at, the level we aim at, um, as things stand, the training that we've, um, we've done with Engineers Island and other training in Ireland through other bodies is, is aimed at a, a pretty fundamental level because we understand that a lot of people who are coming into this industry who suddenly find themselves with, with street lighting assets, one another way of putting it to maintain, don't really have that background. We, we, we quite often deal with people who, up until recently, were, were drainage engineers and mechanical engineers who find themselves looking after uh, a street lighting asset because although it's got electricity in it, it's also a structure and it also has other elements too, with the civil elements as well. So it's a, we're a very, very strange little niche really. Um, so we developed, we developed a, a couple of one day courses uh, that were delivered online that looked to, to, to sort of deal with these two elements. And as I say, it's, it's aimed at that fundamental person who is coming into the industry um, doesn't know a great deal around uh, how to maintain or manage or look after that kind of lit asset and how you might deal with it. It also would translate into other um, transport disciplines, um, sort of anyone who's got large large car parking areas or, or um, like tram systems, this kind of thing. But the principles of a lot of what we're teaching is, 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 is translates into areas like that. Um, the first course that we have is, um, sorry, uh, understanding street lighting assets. So, so this is uh, this is covering the sort of um, the, the the maintenance, management, installation principles of uh, of good practice. Um, the ILP um, have been really successful over the years in producing 
um, uh, lightning guides or reports that are used across the world. We quite regularly get quoted in, to, a lot of the time in ex-British colonies, weirdly enough, but uh, like for instance, Hong Kong use a lot of our documentation verbatim. Um, so we, we, are, we are respected across the world for what we do within highway lighting, um, and we do bring that, that through to it. So it's around this sort of, this sort of element. So the content of the first one day course that we run um, looks at general highway construction regs. So some of the things that fall in, um, and as I say, some of these elements are very different than not just electrical. Um, obviously this course was sitting in the electrical forum, but it is, they aren't just electrical, as I say, we've got other elements to it. Um, we talk a lot about inventories. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't know what they've got. Um, even, even now, I mean, Ireland's in a, a difficult position anyway. They only really devolved in 2010. In the UK, I think it was, it was uh, 1920, and you're still coming to people who don't have comprehensive inventories. Um, what you might do with, with inspections and testing and bits and pieces like that. We talk about risk management and asset management, looking at residual life of assets um, from, a, from a structural perspective and how you might put maintenance programs in place and the bits and pieces to make sure that you don't have things falling over. We do a little bit of electrical generation. This is at a really basic level. Um, as I said, listen to some of the, the courses that are being delivered on here. We're definitely not stepping on your toes with any of that. It's a very short session, just to give some basic oversight, uh, oversight over how that power gets from the power station to the, to the lighting unit, basically. Just so people understand the terminology, it's really high level. Um, and un unmetered energy. Unmetered energy is an unusual one because Lots of the time, highway lighting, you don't have an electricity meter in the individual pole. It's based on an unmetered element. So we talk a little bit about that. We go into regulations and standards and general competence and how that works. And that is linking back to the Irish standards as well, where they exist. Um, from a highway perspective, currently um, the uh, Irish marketplace still uses the British standards. Um, but I, I do believe that is something which is being addressed. There are people working on developing um, developing your own standards. And from what I've been told from people in the industry, that will look quite similar to the, to the, the British standard, which effectively is a guidance document for implementing a European norm. So the, the, a lot of the principles stay the same regardless. It's just how they're implemented. Um, cable terminations, um, again, and, and, and those people on the, on the call who were given costs on this is very much aimed at that public realm outdoor space, if you like. Um, so we talk, we talk at a very fundamental level around the different types of cables, terminations, um, whether it's directly fed from electricity companies, whether it's through the, the, the individual supplies, whether the PL, public lighting, all the different ways that you might find these things, the kind of things you might find in the street lighting column and what that might look like and what's good and bad practice. We've got the basic electrical units. This is, as I said, very, a high level it's aimed at somebody with who could come into this course with some electrical knowledge because you'll pick other bits and pieces up but you could come into it with none at all so we talk at a very simple level around electrical units um we talk about circuit design considerations if you do have electrical design to undertake um how you might do that what you might might look at um talk about single about different distribution systems single phase and, and three phase power supplies how you how power factor implement impacts on our, on our designs Quite typically, you might get a, a, a highway to light, and you could be talking about a, a couple of kilometers of lighting from a, from a single power supply. And you, you, know, you, you have big voltage drops and everything else that goes with that. Talk about how that works and how you might overcome some of these issues um, and how that, that sort of works through. Uh, we also look at some electrical connections information. Again, that links a little bit back to UL06. So it talks a little bit around that, but there's some of the terminology and understanding. And as I say, we, we, we have had people come on the course as we've delivered. And when we asked the question at the beginning, who's got an electrical experience, nobody puts a hand up. So it is very much sometimes aimed at this really basic level of, of understanding. Um, we also go into some circuit protection. So we talk about um, the difference between fuses and RCBOs and RCDs and MCBs and other bits and pieces the pros and cons, how they might be used in our environment um, uh, and everything else that goes with it, the, the, the ways that, that could be adapted. And again, just really trying to give a, a real understanding of the basic terminology and, um, and, and the kind of thing you should see if you take a column door off uh, and, uh, and how that sort of works through. 
And we do a little bit as well on, on earthing and electrical testing. Uh, earthing is very, very important for, for, um, for highway lighting, particularly because if you are running your own supplies, which does happen quite often, you, you can get real issues if you don't undertake your earthing correctly. You can get, you can get uh, well, you don't get enough fault, fault path, so you don't get disconnection in time. So we talk a little bit about that. And we also went a little bit about electrical testing, um, not, not necessarily um, how to undertake it, but just the results you might get back from a competent contractor doing electrical testing, what they might look like, what the results mean, what sort of way you should be looking to see if them results are, com uh, are compliant. And um, we're very much around the, that highway lighting environment. I, I include public realm because, as I say, you, would, you could easily drop car parks into this, you could drop tram system, bus stations, and all of this would sit under this kind of umbrella. And we cover all of these elements. And although um, the bomb be probably more relevant for the big asset owners, the local authorities and others, um, it might also be very relevant for somebody who has, uh, I don't know, let's say a, a university campus or something like that. It could be very relevant for, for that kind of environment. So that, that first course is very much around that understanding of the asset, the kind of things you might find, things you might come across, um, how you might manage it, maintain it, look after it, and everything else that goes with it. Um, these are all these have all been pre-recorded. Um, the, the, this, this course was predominantly delivered by a guy called Peter Harrison and uh, Jeff Lewis, who dealt with different areas of that. At the moment, neither of them are involved in the IOP anymore, both retired, um, but that content is still very relevant. It was only delivered in 2001, so it's still current. Um, and ultimately, um, if we were to deliver this kind of course face to face, we would find suitable replacements for the individuals. But that course gives a really good, broad overview. Um, the sessions are anything from an hour to some of them are 15, 20 minutes. So it, it can be done in bite sized chunks. There's one or two sessions are a bit longer. That's just the nature of the, the beast and how it was cut up, really. Um, but it was delivered um, in 2001 a couple of times and we got really good feedback on it. People felt it was really informative and, and, and pitched at the right level for, for where we were trying to get to. Um, the second course we've got is uh, Understanding Light and Design. And I should have moved the title at the top. I was only, it was only putting this together earlier. This, this is now looking at the lightning design elements. Um, so we still we do still touch a little bit on some electrical stuff, but in main, it's thinking about light itself and how we design with light and good practice for highway lighting, public realm, these kind of things. And again, aimed at that individual who might be coming at this with no real knowledge. So we start off by talking about the nature and theory of light. We, we explain how light actually works, what you need to understand to make good design decisions when we're talking about providing illumination for, um, for out, outdoor areas particularly and um, the, way, the way the eye response works and all this kind of thing. So it's very much that, that basic theory of light. Talk about the eye, vision and colour. That are, they're really important to, to outdoor lighting and, and indoor to a degree, but to outdoor lighting. And if you are doing anything like this, understanding why you're making decisions on things like colour temperature and other things, it's really important to understand the pros and cons of them decisions and how that will actually affect the eye and how the eye will respond. Um, we talk about light sources, LEDs particularly. LEDs are massively prevalent in our marketplace at the moment. Uh, the Irish marketplace currently has got a massive LED replacement program happening within the um, within the, the highway space, uh, with around three hundred thousand units being replaced over a period of time. Um, but once that's done, you've still got all of these issues because you've still got an aging asset, you've still got something which is going to need replacing as it moves along. All these principles are still there. Um, you still have these issues, but that LED replacement will have been done. Um, we look at testing photometry. We talk about some call this P ratio, which is a ratio between scotopic and photopic vision, um, and how that how that affects the eye, the light the levels of light we're talking about, and how glare affects the eye, and how the reduction of glare can improve, improve your visual scene. Look into all of these kind of things. We talk a lot about intrusive light, which is a very hot topic in the public realm at the moment. Um, you know, uh, lots of pe people describe obtrusive light as a weed. It's light where it doesn't need to be. So we talk about principles of that, how you can mitigate that, how you can improve that. It goes with it. Sorry, hang on, I might be lost my mouse. Yep. Uh, we talk about lands and column specifications. So we, we discuss um, how you could specify a good land and a good column to make sure that you don't get something which is, isn't going to last and, and you don't follow the pitfalls of buying cheap, buying twice, if you like. 
Uh, we talk, we go into the basic principles of light and design, um, talk about the different approaches you might take to lighting a motorway, for instance, in relation to a residential street and how they work and why we use them principles, why we light differently for different areas. Uh, we look in depth at residential lighting. So we're looking at this is that human centered kind of level. It's your, it's, your, it's your local streets and everything else. We talk about why we do that, how we do it, the principles of that, what makes good design, what makes best practice. Um, we then also specifically delve into highway design principles. So now we're more your traffic routes, your motorway sections, these kind of things, because they're very different in how we perceive light in their environments. So we, we talk in depth around the two elements as to how that actually works and why you need to make design decisions that are appropriate for the, for the visual task. We we'll talk about that an awful lot in them sessions. Um, we talk a lot about road lighting theory. Now, this, is, this, this goes into detail around um, how, you, how you actually see when traveling at speed, um, how you perceive the, the, the lit environment. And it's very different to what you think. So we talk, in, we talk around um, the principles of that. And once you understand that theory and why it's different to how you would say in a room like I'm in at the moment, and you can make good design decisions. So we've gone to that in quite a bit of detail. We've got the motorway lighting, talk specifically about some of the, the, the um, particular elements that we have on motorways, some of the unusual elements, some of the, 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 the unusual challenges that you have to, have to try and get around um, and how you might do that. We tend to find... The, the road hierarchy is similar to the hierarchy of moving any, any commodity around the country. Your, your, your motorways is where your big gas mains will be, the way your big H3 lines will be, where, the way you're more likely to come across things that could cause you a big problem tends to be in motorways because that's where, where we are moving commodity between two places, whether that's gas, water, electricity or whatever. So we talk a lot about some of them hazards and how we might overcome that and how that might work. Um, we do a bit on high mass lighting. It, it is quite prevalent in Ireland. There's, there's quite a bit of that when you kick around. High mass lighting for us is anything over 18 meters. Um, some people describe it as anything over 20 meters. And it has a it's a very different approach to how you might light with high mass. So we talk in depth around, around how that how that approach is taken, some of the pitfalls again, and how how good practice can give you good design, even if you are using a uh, high mass lighting light in a motorway area, for instance. So we talk in detail around that. And again, we, we go into design standards, obviously key to, um, to what we're trying to achieve. Um, as I said, at the moment, that's very similar to a course you would, you would be delivered if you were in the UK, because in the main, um, the most Irish authorities are currently using the, the British standards as a guide for, for selection of lighting class and things like that. Um, Having we we do as a company we do quite a bit of work in Ireland we 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 helping out on one of the one of the play projects, um, and I think personally I would say Ireland do need their own standards. There are there are certain um, elements that uh, are not commonplace in in the UK and are more commonplace in in the Irish uh, marketplace in the Irish environment. So um, hopefully that does happen at some point. But but fundamentally the principles apply in both respects. So the, the, the principle, we're not really too concerned about that. Um, and we talk about design methodologies and compliance for mass retrofit projects. That was specifically put in because of the, the project going on at the moment, the, um, the plea project where, as I said earlier on, there's this mass replacement of uh, 300,000 plus luminaires happening across the country. Um, so we talked about some good, good principles and that good practice, how that might look. And again, what does good look like, basically, and, and how, how do we work through that? Um, that session probably still does have relevance at the moment because that project is ongoing and it does give people good information. Um, I would suspect in the year or two's time it will become mute because it will have been done um, and maybe it doesn't have the same weight. And, um, and undertaking lighting on other areas, other highway areas, so we're talking about sort of uh, roundabouts and bits and pieces here, so any, any other thing that might be coming earlier on. And again, these sessions, uh, it's a day's course with a, with a potential for half a day or a few hours to do a question and answer session following up. It's, it's broken into individual sections so it can be consumed over a period of time. You don't necessarily have to sit and do it all in one sitting. But there's pretty much eight hours of content in the whole thing. Um, and again, some of them sessions are 15 minutes, some are nearly an hour, uh, just because of the nature of what's being discussed at that particular point. Um, but 
the, the two the two sessions are very complementary. They were designed to be that. You know, we would kind of expect most people to do both because you're trying to get information from both. But if you've got somebody who's an experienced designer who've got no experience in maintenance, then the previous course might be more relevant. Um, but as I say, it's, it's a very different um, offering to the others that we've discussed today in relation to the fact that actually the electrical content isn't huge, but it, it, but it, 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 it sits nicely within this forum because it, it is a key part of it. It is, it is one of the high-risk items. You, the, 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 the two ways you like to kill somebody with a street light, uh, electrical shock or collapse through, through poor management or, or collapse through a, through a collision. Um, so we talk about how we can manage them risks, how we, how we can look at it, and also providing good quality outdoor lighting effectively and how that works. So there, there, that's a, a quick flash through the two, the two costs we currently deliver. Um, one thing that at the moment they're, they're currently online, uh, we have done some in-person training in Ireland. Myself and Pete Harrison came across um, around four or five years ago, and we did some. We also did some earlier with SAAI, um, where we did a, a week course. So we're quite we're quite happy to to do in person, face to face. So what I would say is, if you're interested in any of these courses, but you would rather do that as a face to face session, um, you know, we are more than open for that as long as that works with engineers and with, and with Elver and, and others. We're more than happy to come across and do it. As a, as a, I'm sure the other, other um, lecturers on the call would admit, it's much nicer doing it face to face. It's nice to look into somebody's eyes when you're talking to them. It's a bit more difficult on Zoom, but ultimately, um, not everyone can do it that way. But we're really, we're really keen to do either. Um, we also um, some things that we could, we could look to do um, that we haven't so far, so far with engineers island is um, we did develop, uh, say a few years ago, we did a, a bespoke, um, we call it a certificate in lighting. So it was a week's course. It was uh, five till five. Um, the first three days we covered some of the content we've talked about already. Some of the sessions will naturally fall into this, um, but it finished off the last two days or day and a half doing a project. It was actually applying some of the things that we'd learned. So we, we, we picked a couple of areas, we went through a project and how we might like them and other bits and pieces. And personally, I, lo I love that kind of course, that, that project interaction, that coming together as a group and trying to work something out. I think you get a lot out of it. It's a lot, a lot, be a lot better sometimes than being bombarded with information. Um, but obviously, it, we're just making it work. Again, we would be more than happy to look at that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that, that is something we've, we've discussed, um, we do have actually, the ILP do have an Irish branch, a, a, an Irish language delivery centre uh, with around about 100 members. And we do regularly on the ELD, which is our, our premier lighting course. It's a, it's a three week residential course where we deliver nine till nine. So the 12 hour days, it's pretty heavy going, but that is, it is delivered content for the first uh, two and a half days, uh, an exam and then project for the final part of the course. Um, we, have, we do quite often get a, a, a reasonable amount of Irish contingent on that. I would say typically we'll get five or six people a year traveling to the UK to do the course. And um, we would be up for doing that in Ireland if that was if there was enough need for it or enough want. Um, a little bit of organization, we couldn't do it tomorrow, but it's more than doable. We just need to find the right elements. And that course is split into three areas. Module A is illuminance. So we talk about residential lighting, um, high mast, these kind of things. Illuminance like falling onto a surface. It's a methodology for, for the design process really. So that's talking around the residential and high mass and that kind of thing. And that, that and within that, we also cover all the basic principles of light. So we cover how the eye works, um, the different terminologies and all these kind of things, color temperature and everything else. It's actually a foundation starting point, if you like, but it focuses on the luminance. Module B is luminance. So now we're talking more about your traffic routes, um, your motorways, tunnel lighting, anywhere we'd use a luminance-based approach or so reflected light approach. Um, and again, we do cover some fundamentals in there. There's some fundamentals around luminaire design and bits and pieces we also cover there, but it focuses on luminance. Module C, which is the, the more unusual one, is specialist lighting. So here we cover architectural, um, producing um, lighting impact assessments, reports. We cover um, CDM here, design for maintenance, these kind of things. So this sort of is the mop-up course at the end. All three parts of this are working the same way. They've got an early portion of delivered training and then there's 
a, pro a project undertaken at the end. We've always undertaken that in a hotel because the learners are staying where they're learning. Um, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be done uh, using, a, using a venue like Engineers Island Venue in Dublin. Um, but we would be more than happy to deliver that in partnership with, with uh, Engineers Island and to look at trying to make that work if there was enough, um, enough desire to do it, I suppose, is the right way of putting it, with enough people interested. Um, the, uh, it's just really then looking at, at what, what sort of makes it work from a numbers point of view and what, what, how we make that work. But that is, a, I say, if you were interested in that, but it wasn't being run in Ireland, anyone would be, would be more welcome to, to attend it. The, there's, there's a mechanism that can be in place to try and help that out, but we do do it. But also, the, there's potential to develop tailored courses. Um, we, we do have a suite of, um, of documentation that we produce, technical guidance and other bits and pieces. If, if there was a particular document, bit of documentation or a, something in there that fit, obtrusive light would be a really good one, really good example. Um, you know, obtrusive light's obtrusive light no matter where you are, where you are, it doesn't change because you move, move across the sea. Um, so if, if something like that was of interest to, to your members, we could look at um, trying to amend these courses. We already have a course for that. We try and change that around to make sure it's totally relevant for the Irish marketplace. We would develop the sport courses. If there, was a, if there was a particular hot topic that fell within, that, within the ILP's general remit and the things that we would say we're specialist in, um, we're more than, more than happy to look to develop specific training for, for whatever, really. And we're, we're more than happy to do that in partnership with, with Engineers Island. It's, it's, been a, it's been a really nice relationship to be in from, from, uh, I know from my perspective. I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I'm training rather than doing some of the legwork in the background. I know from speaking to Engine Guy and Peter beforehand, um, it's, it's quite a complementary sort of uh, relationship. So it works really nicely. But we would be willing to, to, to tailor something to the marketplace if need be um, and make sure that it, it totally covered what, what we need to do. Um, so that, that's me. Um, that's my email address. I have an ILP email address my own work one, but I have one on. Guy who was on the call, um, he would be a natural point of contact in some respects because Guy's technical services manager, so he would do a lot of the legwork behind this. Uh, our website's there. If you did want to have a look at that to say, You've got, a, you've got a guidance note on yeah. subtrusive light or, or whatever, really. And, you know, we'd love some training on that. We'd, if, 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 if there's the numbers to do it and the math can be made to work, we would more than happily pull anything together, really, to make that, to make that fit. And anything from, uh, from the sort of half hour, hour session that you could do on something like this, lunchtime session through to a half day, full day, week, course, whatever, we're pretty flexible. The, the beauty that is that we have we have a number of trainers. Um, I'm one of about 10 trainers who are all within the industry. Um, and guy sort of manages, if you like, to a degree, doesn't necessarily tell us what we're doing, but manages the process. Um, so in, in, the, in most instances, we can we can bring somebody in who's got a really good, good, solid understanding of that subject to give really good targeted training. And as I say, I think I think we, we do bring a quite a little niche offering um, to, to Engineers Island members and our own members, obviously, um, to, to try and just uh, further knowledge across the lighting industry, if you like. And as I say, predominantly in that outdoor space, that's, that would be the way to maybe think about it. That's where we tend to sit with most of our, our guidance documentation and everything else that goes with it. So that, that's, that's me. Thanks very much.